Welcome to another in a series of NJPM webinars. The title of today's presentation is a mock civil mediation dealing with disability accommodations after long COVID. The players in the mock civil mediation are Michelle Cresty, who is an arbitrator, mediator, and collaborative law attorney with Mason Cresty, Suzanne English, who practices civil and divorce mediation, Felicia Farber, who is a full-time ADR practitioner serving as a mediator and arbitrator, Brad Ferenz, who is a retired Superior Court judge, who is currently of counsel to BIC Law, and Jonathan Lerner, who is a commercial litigator and mediator with Starr, Gern, Davison, and Rubin. The mock mediation will run about 40 minutes, and then there will be a Q&A period. If you want It has been two years since COVID-19 has been at the top of our news stories. And one of the major issues that we've been hearing about lately has been about people who've had lasting symptoms and effects from the virus. Um, some people who have had COVID-19 have continued to experience these symptoms that can last for months after they were first infected, or they may have new or recurring symptoms at a later time. And people with this condition have been called long haulers, and the condition itself has been referred to as long COVID. So what happens when somebody with long COVID wants to return to the workplace and they need reasonable or special accommodations because of disabilities that have resulted from their illness. That is the scenario that we are going to be presenting uh, to you today. Uh, our employee is Suzanne English playing Martha. I'm representing her. And on the management side, we have Michelle Cresty as the employer and John, um, her counsel is um, Judge Brad Ferenz. And Jonathan Lerner is serving as our mediator. So we're going to start right now. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I, uh, before we start the mediation session, I just want to give you all an idea of, uh, of the process and, um, and let you know, as, as your attorneys know, uh, uh, Martha, you and your employer may not have been through this before, but uh, there is a significant advantage to uh, settling a case at an early stage. And this is not even in court yet. This is a uh, this is prior to any lawsuit being filed. And there's there's a significant advantage because uh, court cases uh, are expensive. Uh, each side is going, would have to pay, pay significant fees to their attorneys, and the court system is, uh, is still slowed down as a result of the uh, pandemic situation, so things are taking lo even longer than they used to, and um, finally, uh, there, it is very hard to predict the outcome of, uh, of a case at this stage. And, and even along the way. So uh, there's a significant advantage if, if we can resolve this uh, now, uh, as opposed to much later on. Uh, so uh, having said that, uh, at first, uh, I want to have a discussion uh, with all of you together where you can convey to uh, the other side uh, your views on, on the situation. Uh, and then after we do that, uh, we're going to break you into separate rooms so you can uh, speak to me uh, separately, each side, you, you and your attorney together. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, we'll go from there. Um, let me know if you have any questions along the way. Uh, this is uh, off the record, by the way, in terms of 
uh, if there is ever a court case, uh, whatever you're saying during this mediation uh, cannot be used uh, if there is a court case. So uh, feel free to say what you would like to say. And when we are in those breakout rooms, when you're speaking to me separate, feel free to uh, tell me if you don't want me to share something that you're telling me on the side with the other side, that's perfectly natural. So uh, with that, uh, why don't we begin? Uh, and um, let me hear from, uh, from uh, Martha, you and your attorney first as to what your situation is. And then I wanna hear from the other side, okay? Thank you, Jonathan. All right, thank you. Thank you, John. All right, so I'm here representing Martha, who has been an employee for Dewey Machinery Part Plus for seven and a half years since 2014. Uh, she was hired uh, due to her outstanding academic college resume as an electrical engineer with a Bachelor of Science. And uh, her position at Dewey has been as a technical services engineer, and um, she has risen up to become senior engineer. Um, she has done extremely well at this company, received exemplary reviews over the years, and has outstanding performance evaluations, always the, the highest possible marks. Um, she also, in addition um, to serving the company well in her engineering capacity, uh, interestingly, has a background as a tennis player. She was a standout in college, and there is this industry league uh, that her company, Dewey, has also asked her to play in, and she has excelled at that and led them to championships, league championships, uh, six out of the last seven years. Uh, the reason that we're here today is unfortunately, Martha contracted COVID, uh, which she believes she got from somebody at the office, but we're going to let that alone for a moment here. Uh, she unfortunately got really, really sick. One of those horrible stories that you hear where she ended up in the hospital for three months, um, you know, almost didn't make it a couple of times and was so debilitated by the virus and the long-term hospitalization that she had to go into rehab for a month uh, following that. And then upon returning home, she has spent the last six weeks in bed, predominantly in bed rest. And it's only the last few days, a little bit less than a week that she's actually gotten out of bed. The problem is, is that Dewey wants her to come back to work on March 1st, which is in a couple of weeks. And she does want to go back to work. She would love to, but she's just not up to that yet. So they won't give her more time. She has asked for more time. And they said, no, if you get, if you don't come back March 1st, then you are terminated. So she said, okay, well, if I come back March 1st, then I'm going to need some accommodations. I'm going to need a little help here. You know, I'd like to see if I can telework, you know, work from home a bit, if you can modify my schedule somewhat. You know, right now the company is located in an old house. So Martha's office is up on the third floor. There's no elevator. It's a walk up. So she said, you know, I would need to have an office downstairs. And they told her, no, all the offices are full. There's no room downstairs for you. And because it's a house and not a big company parking lot, she has to park about a quarter of a mile away at a shopping center and walk down this main road because there's only a small driveway at the house and the owners and uh, top senior management take up those spots. So she needs to have a spot there because she's not gonna be able to do that walk. And uh, lastly, she also would like to bring an emotional support animal to work with her uh, that she needs right now because of um, several of these conditions from COVID that have resulted in a disability. And her dog Muffin is uh, right now her family pet, um, but provides 
the comfort and support that she needs for some of the problems that she has, like um, she's prone to panic attacks, uh, she has severe PTSD, and uh, the dog is a, a calming influence for her. And, um, and she has a note from her doctor. So her internist or healthcare provider uh, has said that she has all of these conditions which have disabled her and she does need the emotional support animal. And unfortunately, Dewey told her, nope, you're not getting any of those things, come back. And she retained me and she, she retained me to sue the company, but I suggested that we try this mediation process first. I found it to be successful and I'm hoping, uh, John, that with your help, maybe we can arrive at some type of solution here before um, you know, we file suit because that's something that you know, I think might be unnecessary if we could work this out. Um, so Martha, I'm just going to ask you to just talk about, um, what you do, you know, what your job is and, you know, the state that you're in right now, your condition. Um, well, my job, you know, does need some amount of my being, uh, you know, out of the office and mobility, but I'm not asking for permanent accommodation. I'm asking for some temporary accommodation and like just simply like little things like parking, which I just think is so insensitive that I, if they could just give me a parking spot, I would be able to get to the office and park and, you know, all these things that are, I can mostly do from even working at home. So why do I need to, why do I need to like, you know, not have a job? And I've been a long term, I've worked for this company for seven years. I know I got COVID at this office and I like, you know, and I'm having, it gives me panic attacks to be in there. And that's why I also need Muffin to come into my, you know, to, with me to the office. Cause she really helps calm me down. I don't have to worry about it. I mean, I don't think anybody realizes what, how difficult it is to have been ill like this and then have to come back to the world and then have such an uncaring employer that they won't even give you a parking space so that you can get into the building. I, you know, I don't know, Felicia, I don't know. All right, and um, could you just talk a little bit about your job? You know, you have uh, a long-standing job. You're valued by this company just on a day-to-day -day basis. Could you just tell everybody what you were doing? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I like, you know, and I, and I, I, I you know, I have a, a master's and I'm able to do things and I go in and a great deal of what I do isn't actually, you know, I guess sales wise to get new clients and things like that. I do need to be meet in person, but they've been accommodating. They've had other people doing that now for five, six months and doing fine. And yet, and but I, I can also give backup support to those people, but I may not right now, I'm not asking for forever. I can't go in and necessarily meet with them and do those things. But I, you know, I don't have that, this idea that I'm somehow this hands-on fix it person is not correct. A lot of what I do is more consulting and telling people how to do things and problem solving. And those are more analytical skills that can be done anywhere. I don't need to go up to a third floor that's, you know, that by the time I get there, I can't breathe. And it's never, it's either hot or cold. It's never a good place to be because it's on the third floor of this old rickety house and shouldn't be allowed even without COVID, but I'm not even going to go there. I mean, but I just, I'm so insensitive, insensitive by my employer that they won't even, they're just like tough, be back, be normal, you know, nothing is nothing happened COVID doesn't exist you just get on with it that's what I feel like I really do and Martha you told me you're in physical therapy now so you are trying to well, get I, yourself I, I'm supposed to start but my doctor has told me that I'm like you know I have a really good prognosis I just need to if you've been really sick you don't understand it's like you just everything is hurts it's sore you're tired your body is recovering and we had these great tools to help me. And I was told that physical therapy was going to be a really key thing. And I don't want to wear myself out walking up steps when I need to put my energy into physical therapy. And I don't think it's asking too much to just for, to do two or three months of physical therapy to get myself back to where I need to be to do my job without any impediment. 
Okay, but just to be clear, you are willing to come back, but on a modified schedule so you could fit in your PT also. And I also need, I do need my, my pet because I I'm suffering from PTSD and you know that, and that, and I, I, no matter what, no matter, I know I can't prove I got COVID at work, but I didn't, I was so careful. I didn't even go to the grocery store. I had my groceries delivered. The only place I went was work. So where else could I have gotten COVID? So if you had that, would you be scared of that place? You know, you can get COVID again and again, we're seeing that. And so I have a lot of stress from that and anxiety. And my doctor said that using a therapy dog would really help me to get over that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you both for, for, for your thoughts. That's very helpful. Now I'd like to hear from uh, your employer. So, Jonathan, thank for the opportunity. Thank you for coming here and trying to work this out. Uh, Felicia, thank you. And first of all, Martha, I got to tell you that your employer, Michelle, thinks very highly of you. She's reached out and done everything she possibly can for you. And I think the actual facts and history really demonstrate that. You got to remember, there's not a single other employee that I'm aware of that got COVID. And you he sit here and basically blame your employer and that work site for getting COVID. That's something that makes it very difficult to believe you want to come back and work with us when you come into this mediation accusing your employer of getting well, with it. all due respect. I'd like Brad, to finish what there. I'd like to finish just I as think you my finish. Knows who I would going. like to finish. Let me hear from uh... just like you finished. You said, many things that we disagree with. you said many things that we disagreed with. And I had the courtesy of listening quietly. And my client sat there listening quietly. Well, she picture was painted of her and her company that is just simply not accurate. Now, if you don't mind, well, if we're I'd talking like about accurate, if you she don't mind, I would like to You are not going to continue. Not 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 we are not continuing. Hold on, hold on, everybody. I'm not paying for this. Now, listen, hold hold on. Let me just hear. No, we should not. I heard from from the employee and her attorney for for 10 minutes. Now, let me hear from the employer and her attorney for 10 minutes, okay, without any interruption. Thank you, Jonathan. So I think that's really unfair. I think you take a look at the fact that when you got sick, you didn't get a week off or a month (laughs) off or two months off. They gave you six months paid without any question, with insurance, with coverage, hoping that you could come back. You guess you got great evaluations because you were a great and inval- great and valuable employee. And if you can come back and be a great and valuable employee, I have no question but the company would want you back because that's what we base all our decisions on. Whether or not you can come back is not based upon anything other than your ability to come back. Now, we looked at, for example, the letter that says that you need an emotional support dog. It's not from a psychiatrist or a psychologist. It's from an internist, somebody that really isn't qualified by by the wildest stretches of your imagination to make the kind of decision that we need to rely on. You said that you're not gonna be able to um, do the things that you really are required to do. We're not talking about whether or not we get you a downstairs office or an upstairs office or whether a quarter of a mile, which is nearly not very far, is too long for you to walk. But if you can't walk a quarter of a mile, how are you going to make visits? How are you going to see people? You know, part of your job involves going out if a machine breaks down. And sometimes you'd have to spend nights there. Sometimes you have to stay with the machine, with the client overnight. How can you do that? And you said quite candidly, and we appreciate it, that we have been covering for you. And we have. There are five engineers. You are the fifth. You are out. Four people have been covering for you for the last six months. And I have to tell you, several of them are very concerned. One has expressed real concern about the fact that they do not want to continue doing the work of five when there's only four. Another one, when you suggested bringing in Muffin, who, by the way, I understand is a German shepherd, a large German shepherd. And you want to bring the dog in. And I respect that. I've got dogs. I understand that. They're allergic to dogs. They're afraid of dogs. We have one each. One person tells us they're allergic. Another allergic. Another person tells us they're afraid of dogs. How do we accommodate them? 
It is not that we don't want you back. It's that we are not being offered any kind of reasonable request for accommodation. Accommodation. We're being asked to take you back without even knowing whether you're going to be okay in a month, okay in six months, okay in a year, able to function, or how long you're going to be able to function. All we know, and I hate to put it this way, is that you can't do the job now, and we have nothing to say you're going to be able to do the job tomorrow, next week, or next month. So I'm happy to sit down with Michelle and say, you really need to give her a shot. You need to accommodate her, but you're going to have to tell us how. You're going to have to give us some time frame. You're going to have to give us some pretty structured rules that you're going to have to agree to if you want to resolve this, because we can't do this on a hope and a prayer. There's a business being run. You know, part of your responsibilities is to fly out to different different places. Chicago, you got an account in Chicago. We're supposed to take people out to dinner, sell the machines, explain how the machines work. You can't do that with an emotional support dog. They're not allowed on airplanes. They're not allowed to fly with you. It's a, it's a helpful animal, not one that, that, if you will, is a service dog, a registered service dog that you can even take on an airplane. You can't function. So it's not that we don't want you back. It's not that we don't want to accommodate. It's just that you're a, there are no accommodations that have been requested that we, in fact, can provide that can make you a functioning, functional employee. And, and that, Jonathan, is a problem. Um, but on the whole thing is a problem. You can hear why we're here. And maybe this was a mistake because, you know, under the ADA, under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, under Section 1557 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, under all of them, Martha has a disability under the law and with her long COVID as a cogn cognizable disability, her accommodation requests are reasonable and she is entitled to them. And as you hear, the employer is denying very reasonable requests. And what he says is just completely not true that she can't do the job right now. The breed, really? the size, the weight really? of her dog. She can, she can do the job right now? So you are willing, let me interrupt for a You are willing to set not forth a, a whole list of things she can do. And if she's unable to do them, you agree that you will leave. She is You're able willing to, to do give her a job, job. Yeah. and what she's asking for are- You are willing to give us a structured plan, a tower. structured plan. Well, that if is why we back. are here today, counselor, but you well, are not listening to what I presented. Stop making accusations. You want to file a lawsuit? File it. You want to work together to resolve it? Resolve it. Give us something, because what you're giving us now is impossible. John, I just have to say, he's yeah, trying to let's... make it sound like the employer has been so accommodating and reasonable. She's been out on short-term disability. That's how she's been paid Six for the past months? few months. Her doctor is a board-certified physician. Internist. That's ridiculous Internist. to say that her doctor is not qualified. You let, heard how belligerent uh... he is about a quarter of a mile walk. I'd like to see him get COVID and, and then end up walking a quarter of a mile. Are you telling us, are you telling us, wait a minute, are you telling us that if you in her walk, she can function in all other areas? Is I that what like you're telling us? With, I'd like to speak with each of you separately, but before we do that, um, Michelle, do you have something to uh, to add to what your attorney you know, says. At this juncture, I'm really going to hold my tongue because frankly, I am very, very disappointed in this whole system. First off, being called insensitive, just beyond, it is beyond disrespectful to me as an employer. And then referring to me as he, constantly, he, really? In these, were, in these days of using appropriate pronouns, at least get that right. You want to talk about being insensitive? All right, I will decline saying anything else further, um, but I feel like I see where this is going. And uh, I really uh, am looking towards just getting this done and over with because I, I don't think this is going to be very fruitful. So I would rather just leave right now. I know my counsel is telling me that I should sit it's through tight. this, but that's enough. Let, let me let me I'd like to hear from each of you um, separately. So why don't we uh, I'm going to put you in breakout rooms, as we call them. And uh, let me speak with um, uh, Martha, you and your attorney first. OK, before we go, I just like to say, Ms. Cresty, that clearly the he that I was referring to while I was speaking was your attorney, not to you. Oh, thank you. I'm insensitive because I'm representing the client zealously. We'll be waiting for you, Jonathan. If that's what you call it.
Okay. So, Martha, sorry about everything you've been going through. I, I got to be a real journey. It's very hard. Um, one of the issues I'm curious about is uh, is your your job. Um, the work that you do is is how much of it involves on on site work and and travel and and we meetings. My job right now would be affected. I like they you know they they didn't neglected to tell you how many times they called me even when I was sick. You know, um, to to consult to do these things. I mean, most of what I do is not is to help direct other people. It's not me physically being there hands on. I can, I mean, I, I can do such an overwhelming amount. And to be honest with you, the reason they don't want me there is because they, he, uh, they love their tennis program. They, you know, they have this competitive tennis. I found out after I had gotten hired, one of the reasons I got the job was because I was a really competitive tennis player in college and I've continued to do so. And my game was great prior to COVID. Now there's no way I can't, you know, they know if I can't breathe to get up the stairs, I'm not going to be able to breathe on the tennis court. And why that's really why they don't want me anymore. That's the reason. It's nothing to do with anything. I mean, you can see that they don't care. That, I mean, what, what employer wouldn't give me a, you know, a parking space, especially, you know, as a disability, and yet they're not even willing to do that. It's like, oh, no, that goes to top management. And we don't have to conform with the Americans Disability Act, because it's a private parking lot, whatever that means. I just, I don't know, I'm really, it's, I just feel that this is like all about just a way of getting rid of me because I can't play tennis. Right. No, I didn't that, that, tell you that, John. Yeah, because you're, you're, I, I think you heard that they're already interviewing people and a couple of their applicants are tennis players, right? Yes. I mean, and, yeah. that's, and I think that they probably, honestly, I think that this is their opportunity because, you know, I've gotten older. I'm not as keen on my game even prior to COVID. And I think they're looking like, oh, this is a great way to get rid of her. And, right. and you know, with this, I, got, I mean, of course I got COVID from them. They're like, oh, nobody else got it. I didn't, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have children in schools or anything. And I was like, and I didn't grocery shop or anything. And then I get COVID. I mean, what did they, I mean, and I don't care. I'm not, I know we can't prove it. I'm not trying to do that, but they have to understand why I'm scared of being in that office with, uh, you know, the fact that I can get COVID again. Nobody One of the things, and the reason I asked you about your your what your job, uh, what what kind of services you provide, is you, you have to be able to establish that if they accommodate you in in the ways that you're asking for, then you'll be able to do your your job. If I had an assistant, especially on like, you know, to go do the hands on stuff, I would be able to do it. I mean, I could direct people. I can tell them I'm there as, you know, it, 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 you know, a reasonable accommodation. It's like my skill set isn't physically doing it. It's what I've gotten here that is the most important thing. And that I can direct other people to. And they, okay. did, they sat there and said, oh, well, all these people are going to come. I've been, uh, you know, helping, you know, take over for me and all this other stuff. Well, you know, they don't tell you that they call me all the time to ask, how does, you know, what needs to happen here? They, they've been reliant on me when they weren't supposed to be because I was on disability, by the way. Right. And, you know, just coincidentally to the engineers that they have interviewed because, Martha is obviously close with some of the people that are still in the office. So she's been told it. that. I, I love it. I love my office. I love, I, I can't believe I'm here like this. This is like, this is like the worst nightmare to go through this horrible illness and then think you're going to get to come back and start trying to be some level of normalcy and then to have them like say no to you and, and then you realize it's because they want to replace you for 10. They want to replace her and two of these people happen to be tennis standouts at their colleges that they're trying to replace her with. So they're not transparent at all. We see right through them. And you saw how they made every single thing that she has asked for to be a big deal and to be a non-starter. And, you know, I was hoping that this would be different today, that we could work this out in mediation, but she does have grounds for a suit and I think that's the direction we're gonna have to go. Well, just, just let, let me talk to them and come back, but uh, gives just uh, 
give some thought. There are some aspects of your job. You, you do have to go on site from time to time, right? Yes. And, and if you can't, um, that, 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 that's going to impede your ability to uh, to, to wait. Wait, it. I'm sorry, John. She can sorry. at this moment in time. She's been out of bed about a week now, and she's getting stronger every day. She hasn't started physical therapy yet, so that's what we're asking for: is a little more time before her start date kicks in, or if they're making her come back March 1st, which is unreasonable considering her her extended hospitalization and her rehab, then we're asking to have a modified schedule that includes telework as well. And as far as the dog, she's also, we're very aware of the distinction between an emotional support animal and a service animal. So she does have the note from her doctor for her, her pet muffin, but the dog is not certified and is not trained. So she has enrolled him in a class uh, to receive that certification and that will be starting up soon. So to go that route, she's prepared to do that as well. That's an expense. And service dogs, if you have them, you know, they're saying allergic, whatever, they're, they're groomed more, they, their ignorance is there because they're groomed much more often. And they, because of that extensive grooming, they don't carry the same kind of allergy issues as other dogs. And so I don't really see that as a problem. Oh, okay. and Martha, didn't you tell me how that the owner the... has dogs? Um, Michelle has dogs and has everybody come oh. to her house at Christmas, right, a, for her? It's a poodle. It's like, it's not even a dog. It's this little poodle that comes in there all the time and is there everywhere in everybody's face. It's a, not even a poodle. It's a cockapoodle or thing. It's like this, you know, and it's like, bah, bah, bah. It, it, it can, I'm on the phone with clients and it's barking and that's okay, you know, but that's because it's her dog. How much time do you need in, in terms of a, of a modified schedule? How much time to come back for? She doesn't uh, know. If we could push this out to April 1st instead of March 1st, she might be able to just come back and hit the ground running without any of these modifications, but they're demanding March 1st. But please, really right. to let me talk back. to them and uh, sorry, Martha, I, I'm, we're running out of time. Let me, let me talk to them. Give some thought to, to, uh, if, if you're going to have a modified schedule for, for more than a month, uh, then give some thought to maybe uh, offering uh, to a reduced uh, salary to, uh, to, to give them an incentive to go along with you. I'm not, I don't know where they're coming from yet. I haven't talked to them. I'm just saying uh, it may be worth um, offering to, uh, to reduce your pay slightly to... Uh, to accommodate them. Martha, is that something you would consider? I can't no. do. And I also, I don't want to reduce my hours. I want to change the scope of my hours, but I don't want to reduce my hours because I need my my benefits. Because yeah, so this, by modified the, schedule. Just consider that if this doesn't play out the way you want it to and, and you're you're terminated, then, then you're going to be making zero for a period of time. So just give that some thought. Oh, well, thank you, John. Judge, a judge will really have discriminating against me, and this won't be an issue. But. No, John, that, that's a good point. Thank you. But also, you know, please, when you talk about modified schedule with the other side, you know, talk about telework. She has been, you know, working from home for the most part during her illness because they have been calling her up. So she's already been doing it. So we would just continue that if necessary. Okay. Okay. Let me um, let me talk to them. Okay. I'll come back. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi, Jonathan. How are you? Okay. So one one of the issues that they're that, that they're focused on is is about tennis. Uh, oh, yeah. I know. I'm just <laughs> saying it's just something. That, and apparently, you're interviewing a couple of people. Yeah, we, potential we, uh, employees. We've interviewed several people. I think did Michelle speak for herself, but I think she's narrowed it down to a couple of folks um, who she believes will be able to do the do the job and show up. But let me back back up a second. It is not that the company and Michelle is not willing to 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 bend. It is not that we're not willing to accommodate. We're more than willing to accommodate, John, but we're not willing to just open up and accommodate something that morphs into something else. Give us something. Don't tell us you, you, you're going to bring in a German Shepherd. You know, go get go get yourself a non-shedding dog. You know, get get a dog that's trained. 
You know, don't tell us, you, you, you know, you need that you can't walk, you know, a quarter of a mile, you know, and you need to be downstairs. Work with us. OK. Um, and she's not. She's come to us with a list of demands. She wants everything and we can't accommodate everything. She's a good employee. She's got great recommendations, great evaluations. Absolutely. Tennis has got nothing to do with it. Um, is it a social event for the company? Yeah. Do they enjoy playing tennis? Yeah. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, John, her ability to function. Will she be able to function in six months or a month or a year? We don't know. And in a year, we'll be back with the same argument, fighting the same fight. Or are they willing to sit down and say, OK, here's a here's a calendar of events. If I can't do A, B, C, D and E in, in a month, OK, I will voluntarily resign. OK, if I can't do something else in two months, I'm not meeting your expectations. You don't need to accommodate any further. Give us something to work with. We've had four employees covering for her and she complains that they will on occasion call her and ask her about an account, you know, come on. From what she, from what she described, she, she can do a lot of her work remotely. Is that true? Michelle? Working yeah, I, 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 there's, there's a significant amount of work when you're dealing with engineering, electrical engineering in particular, that could be done online, but not all of it. There's you know, to jump in, you know, John, may I call you John? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you run a business yourself? Do I run a business? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 I'm, I run a law firm. <laughs> okay. All right. It's a business, right? You're not doing it for free, are you? No. No. Okay. You have salary, payroll, clients, right? Yes. Right. You have a, you, you have a firm um, environment. You have the way you run your firm, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We have the way we run my firm too. And the bottom line is we're not doing this for fun. Yes, we enjoy our work, but we're not doing this for fun. It's a business. Business means people go to work and we get paid. I expect my employees, like myself, to be at their desk. That's where our clients expect to find us. If they call in, they don't expect to get patched through or emailed through or whatever it is. They're expect to be found in their offices. That's where that's where we are. And my firm environment is, is that we collaborate and we do work together. And that doesn't mean that somebody is in East Jibip or wherever they are. They're in our office and we do work and many times projects and client work, which is the bottom line. And the reason why we exist is to serve our clients is because they are project-based and they require input from multiple people. And so while, well, yes, Martha is, an, Martha is an integral part of our team, and this is a team. And yes, this whole thing about tennis, great, tennis. Yes, many of us have a tennis background because I like that environment. I like the team environment, and that's who we are. And everybody is. You can't win a doubles match if one person is one-handed, okay? And that's exactly what she is. And she knows it. And if she wants to do her job, she can be sitting at her desk doing her work. All right. If she needs to go on the disabled list for a little bit, then she better have her trainer give me a pretty good darn reason why she needs to be on the firm disabled list. And I'll work with her. But that's it. And it better be reasonable. And that's, I think, what she's saying. Let me read read between the lines. What she's saying is, love to work with her. But what she's demanding is the unknown. She's not giving us anything that enables, you know, Michelle to run her company. She doesn't know whether she's going to have to replace her in six months. She doesn't know whether she's going to have to replace her in a month. She doesn't know whether it's going to get better or worse. She's coming and saying, do everything I want you to do because, oh, what was me? I, I believe it. We're empathetic. Okay. Well, let's, yeah, let, let, me, let, me, let me make a suggestion because we're running out of time here. What about um, uh, picking a time frame, like let's say three months, not six months, six months is a long time. And I don't know when she is gonna be able to come back uh, to be able to do, do everything. Uh, let's say three months as a suggestion. And then, uh, but so for the next three months, she can do most of what she does remotely from home. And if, if we, you get to the three month point where uh, she can't. Yeah, I hear where you're going. A month. She can have a month. 
I don't, I don't think a month is going to be enough. Yeah, like. Michelle, can I speak to Michelle for, for a second? Michelle, why don't we give her more time, but make her get be evaluated by our people? Let's pick a psychiatrist or psychologist or somebody who specializes in in, in the effects of long term COVID and COVID, and let's let's let her submit to our so we know we're going to get an honest evaluation, okay? And, and if she's willing to do that, then let's let's give her another additional sixty days. And let's permit her to do work at home during that period of time, which she says she can do. All right. Because your other folks, your other, you know, engineers really do need help. And this will enable them, if you will, to have the help. They'll have to do more outside work. They're going to have to cover her for that. But you'll have a time frame. She'll either be able to come back, you know, in, in 60 days and we'll have or we're going to have. If we say 60. If we say 60, is she going to say 120? Aren't we better off saying 30? And then okay. she's asking for six months. Are we okay. better off saying 30 right now? Okay. I understand yeah. what you're saying. I mean, mm -hmm. right now I have multiple requests for proposals from clients. How do I know how to respond to them? Mm -hmm. that's that, Jonathan, that's a fair statement. All right. Well, I'll, I'll tell her you're willing to. You're willing to do 30 days so she'd be able to work from home as as much as she wants for 30 days and there's there's some other things that we need to talk about to put in the package she's got to submit to an exam of a, of a certified doctor you know somebody from from our choosing that specializes in the particular area from which she believes she suffers you know i want i don't want an internist i want somebody who knows the disease to the extent that it can be known okay i know um, dog I, I don't need somebody to this dog taking a bite out of somebody and now it's my and now it's my fault. And there's a big difference between a, a, a service animal and, you know, and, and an animal that, you know, is an emotional support animal. I mean, th there's no legal requirement to bring in a dog because you love dogs and they calm you down. OK, she wants to get the dog trained and come back. I think we'd have to listen, but I don't think Michelle even has to listen at this point. Or, or get a true service dog. I mean, there yeah. is not a dog coming in our business that's mm -hmm. not a true service dog. Mm -hmm. I, again, I, I don't even. If she had a true service dog, how would that work? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that work? And one that did not shed because she has an engineer who's allergic to the dogs. Okay. We'll consider it. I have to consider that. Okay. okay. Fair. All right. Let me talk to them and uh, and I'll come back. All right. Okay. Okay, we're uh, we're running out of time here, but let me just uh, they're they're willing to uh, Martha let you work uh, from home for for a month, and uh, but they they want you to agree to be evaluated uh, by a um, some physician that they select to determine your situation and your your needs. And they also want you to have a service dog as opposed to a comfort dog. My dog will be certified as a service dog. So that's all that, you know, as long as that meets the thing. But the thing is, I was told by my doctor, I need two to three months. So you're telling me a month. I mean, can I, I need more time than a month. I know that. And the other thing is they want me to pick a doctor of their choosing. That seems barbaric. I would be willing to pick a somebody off of a list that we both you know a long list that we both mutually agree with but i'm not just going to have one doctor that they randomly throw at me yeah john i i don't think that's a good idea she has had so many doctors that have cared for her over the past five and a half months uh so she just has a letter from one but she has physical and emotional impairments so she has the physiological symptoms she has neurological symptoms so when they just say random doctor to get her evaluated that is ridiculous and everything that she has been through is well documented there's a record of it so i i don't think that that is something that i would advise my client to accept at this point um and okay yes. would you would you would, would you accept a, a neutral not not a doctor they select, but, a but why? Doctor why if we if we on. showed her if, if Martha was willing to show some of her medical records from an extensive hospitalization where she almost died on more than one occasion, and as well as her um, 
her, her, you know, present treating physicians, I don't see any reason at all to have to have her go to another physician. Okay. Okay. So I think we are at what, 1245. So let's go to the, um, to our participants and see if they have some questions. So are there any questions? We must have questions. Okay, one hand has been raised. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, uh, Terry. Hi, everyone. Good presentation. Hello, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, right at the beginning, John, you said that um, every, everything was off the record for mediation, that it couldn't be used in court. Obviously, some of the information here, did you mean to say that the mediators could not be used in court, as I understand the situation to be? No, just that uh, if anyone says anything during the mediation, it, it can't be it can't be quoted because it, it's off it's off the record. Thank you. Okay. Um, while other people are considering their questions, let me ask you a couple of things. Uh, John, you said about the caucus, when you go into caucus, tell me if there is something you don't want me to share uh, about what, what is said in the caucus. Is that your normal rule that nothing is confidential unless you tell me it is? Yes, I, I, yes, I, that is, that, that's my normal way of doing it just to, uh, I don't necessarily share everything because some things you, are, are not helpful if you share them. But uh, I, I always make that point at the beginning just to give each side a warning that whatever they say could be shared if they don't tell me otherwise. Okay. And um, you threw out a couple of suggestions. One which was to uh, Felicia and, and uh, Suzanne or Martha and lawyer, one which was reduced salary and just kind of threw that out there. I was wondering, why did you say that as opposed to saying something else or a number of things? I, because I just, I had the impression from the, the angry discussion we had before the uh, breakout that uh, the em employer would need something, something in its favor to uh, to agree to, to some kind of deal. And, so and that was you, my, that's why. How'd you pick a reduced salary? I'm just curious as to it, it, why it ran, that. Random, 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 just random. Okay. okay. And another one you did was, uh, let's see. Um, oh, three months, uh, the sort of trial period, I guess, of three months. Yes. Okay. And again, you just picked that because you thought that was something that might sell? Well, I picked that because I could tell from speaking with um, Martha and her attorney that uh, she needed uh, at least at least two, one or two, more than two, maybe. So I, I wanted to to go to a, a range that would be that would work for both sides. So that's why I, I suggested three months. Your style as a mediator, um, especially for a lawyer mediator, is not very interventionist. I know a lot of lawyers who would be, when some of these people are cross-talking and doing on, going on a long time, would be cutting them off and being, what I would say, uh, they, they think is much more in control. Would you, was that, is that a, a good characterization of your style? Well, I wouldn't have, normally I wouldn't have the group meeting that we had in, in a case like this, because typically an employment case, it, it, it does get out of hand if you, if you try to have a, uh, a discussion with both parties present at the same time. If it was a more of a business transaction or something where, where it could be a, a lower level discussion, then, uh, it would be easy, easier to interrupt and jump in. Uh, so the only reason I wasn't able to do that here is because of our platform here. It was hard to, uh, okay. otherwise I would. 
I'd be a little more aggressive that way. You don't like joint sessions? Uh, I do. It depends on the case. Totally. It depends on the, on the, uh, the emotional level of, of the case, really. Okay. Um, is, it, is it purely the emotional part of it, or is there some other reason that you uh, prefer caucusing to a joint session? Well, I, I prefer a part of a, at least a partial joint session at the beginning, because uh, it, 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 get each, it gives each party, uh, even if there's a aggressive um, a commentary back and forth, that uh, each party that's feels the feels the pain a little bit. So yeah. I, I I think that's an advantage to promoting a settlement. If you let that go on too far, then sometimes it works in the opposite direction. That right. people get pissed and they don't want to be cooperative at all. Um, Felicia seemed willing to let Martha do a fair amount of talking. Uh, do you, which I think is good, uh, do you ever call upon the actual parties rather than the attorneys to you say, tell me what the case is about? Something like that as opposed to always hearing from attorneys? The question is directed to whom, Carl? That's John. John. That's John. I'm sorry. Oh, I thought it was to Felicia. You said Felicia. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. No, it's to, to you, John. <laughs> what, what did you want to know exactly? I couldn't. I didn't oh, follow okay. That. The question is Do you ever call directly upon the, uh, upon the parties rather than, you know, sort of letting the, the lawyers by default say what the case is about and do most of the talking? Brad did a lot more of the talking uh, and Michelle a lot less. So I'm, I'm just wondering about your style. Will you ever just ask the parties to talk? In a group meeting, it, it usually it's the attorneys who do the talking. And, and if the party wants to jump in, they can. In caucus, uh, I, I often ask the parties questions directly. And, and, and want input from them and want to create a, uh, a dialogue with the actual party. Okay. Um, let me see, I know we have one up here, but I can't get it up. Okay, uh, Mark, go ahead. Um, I, I was just curious, uh, Jonathan, the, there's a lot of law in favor of accommodations to people with disabilities. So parking spaces, you know, a service dog, whatever, those, those would just be allowed, right? That they're not core functional elements of that the employer could actually say. If, I mean, those, those are non-essential elements. Why did you not choose to actually be more informative to the parties about the law? And, because I, I think it would have you you would have gotten them not have been so necessarily radical in terms of their opinions. Well, I did. I, I mean, the 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 important issue is that the employee has to be able to uh, to do her job uh, if she gets the accommodations, and that that's the issue I raised. If you get the if you if you get the accommodations and you can't do your job, then you don't satisfy the requirements. Uh, of the statute, so uh, I did raise that part. Um, I didn't think that the, if we had a longer mediation that went out, you know, I would have talked about the uh, office space and the uh, parking and all that, but I, it turned out that that really wasn't an issue. But, so but, but I, I would just, I would just think you would say, you, you know, if this goes to, if this goes to a suit, you're gonna, you're gonna lose on parking space. Right in terms of doing this, if she needs medically, she needs a parking space. You're going to lose on that. So can we just put that issue aside and know that you're going to have to accommodate them on that? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Um, but but again, it didn't and it didn't get in the way of, of of the discussion. So that's why I didn't bring it up. Mark, have you noticed that our our position was when can you actually come back and do the job completely? We didn't really argue much about parking places. We didn't really argue really much about having a, um, a, a necessary service dog as opposed to an emotional support dog. 
Um, and I think those are the kind of things that uh, Michelle and I would have given up quickly. Um, we were looking, I think, to have a time frame within which she could actually function entirely as a full-time employee. Uh, and that's what we would be conditioning everything on, I think. But, but, Knowing, Mr. Mark, certainty. but just in terms of completely, that, that's, that's mm -hmm. the issue in terms of what's, what's the definition of completely. Well, I have to, I, I've got to tell you, um, in terms of a medical person, um, I don't think uh, we would have signed off, and I haven't checked with, with Michelle, but I think we would have signed off unless we had an independent medical exam, period. Um, I think you're entitled to it in any legal case. Um, and if a suit was what we'd be entitled to it, they would know that. And we could use that as a much more demonstrative piece of evidence showing what she is capable and not capable of doing. And we could justify our conduct based upon it. And we could trust the analysis because it'd be an independent medical exam. All right. Well, to Mark's point, I, I think that the frustration in the joint session was that, Brad, it was no to everything across the board when, yes, she would be entitled to a handicapped parking spot. She would be entitled to, yeah. the, to bring the service dog. These should have been non-issues. And then maybe, you know, once she would have gotten a yes to some of the things that she's entitled to by law, then she could have even considered, okay, you know, um, an IME, but we were nowhere near that point. And the law is really in her favor on so many of these things. And so that's why just the obstinance of the employer no to everything across the board, uh, you know, I think it would have been helpful you know for them to have an understanding at the beginning that they by law had to give her some of these things these just weren't requests that were discretionary well, right, are but you suggesting are you suggesting felicia that that was the duty or that was something that john as the mediator should have been saying uh, well, if we had more time, I would have said it. So somebody had to say it either, you know, given more time, me or, or the mediator. Okay. Right, but, but again, when you said the law requires it, the, the plaintiff has a burden of proof, right? Just because she says it doesn't make it so. So right, I think that judges require, you know, judges suggestion to say, okay, put your money where your mouth is. Let's get is, an So independent. this is pre-suit though. The whole idea was not mm -hmm. to have to go and have her become a plaintiff and have a judge intervene. It was trying to get the other side to be reasonable and recognize she's going to get this anyway, except you're going it's, to be paying never, after Because it was a short, we never got to the point where we were reasonable. Okay, okay. But you're talking now the substance of this. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But and we, this is this, about mediation, not about who wins in this thing. Right, in the but, beginning, but, let me, let, I want to go off on a different way. Okay. Um, last week, there was a joint meeting of the Garibaldi in New Jersey State Bar Association, CDR committee, and then JPM. And the speaker was Dwight Galan, and he's the research professor of law of Suffolk University in Massachusetts. And uh, in another place, this is how he described what he does as a civil mediator. He says, I investigate facts ask hard questions, press for offers, uh, advise bargainers, predict litigation outcomes, make proposals and deal with other obstacles as needed in each case. I'm willing to use unorthodox tactics in the service of settlement. Do you do those things, John? Do you do all of them? Would you say you exclude any of them? In other words, do you do a wide range of things or do you find some things are just too far and you don't go there? Uh, uh, most of the time I don't. I, I, I spend time with each side uh, trying to get them uh, the best result I can for each side and go back and forth that way. And uh, I don't, but if we get to the point where uh, they're too far apart and then they need uh, an evaluative uh, uh, communication, then I will sometimes make the point that uh, their case isn't as strong as they think it is, or uh, the case is weaker than they think it is, or, or what have you. So will you predict outcomes? I, I try to avoid that um, as long as I can. And occasionally we get to that point where 
where I will. But essentially, you're going to do everything. Yes. You're going to you're going to go from being facilitative all the way to telling someone this is what's going to happen if you litigate. Felicia, yes. you do the same thing. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, we start off, I think everybody way more facilitative and then in order to get them where you need to be, then you do pick up that evaluative um, edge and, and that plays way more as the mediation gets deeper so that you can ultimately resolve it. Okay, Michelle? I sort of do it, yeah, I do it all in stages. And if it really comes down to like evaluating, I don't like to, to come out with a decision because I make it very clear at the beginning, this is not a, you know, a hearing, it's not a motion hearing, it's not a trial, it's not an arbitration where I make findings of fact, conclusions of law. So I rather say things like, you know, if it really gets down to it, like Felicia just said, like deeper into the proceedings, I might say, well, you know, 30,000 feet in the air looks like this or looks like that and sort of suggest, I think it's leaning more towards one side or the other. Yeah, but you said you don't, you, you don't like to do it. Will you do it? I will, like, but it couched in that way. Okay. You know, couch, you know, I try to couch it up because I, I distinguish the process of mediation versus arbitration and some of the other options in that way at the beginning. You know, you didn't hire me to make decisions. You didn't hire me. You, you helped me to help facilitate a decision. Okay. Brad? I think, Michelle, you're absolutely right when you say that you're hired to help facilitate the resolution. So I do sort of what you're asking, Carl. I don't predict an outcome. I predict the worst possible outcome. And by that, I mean, I'll say, look, I don't know what a jury is going to do, or I don't know what the court's going to do, but you know, they could do this um, and they have a right to do that. And yeah, you've got a great case. And, but even if there's a 25% chance, you're going to lose this case. You got to consider that um, when you're trying to come to what you believe to be a fair resolution, nothing in the world is a, is a locked case. So I try to get both sides to understand you know, when you're talking about an adversarial procedure in a courtroom and a judge who could not let you let evidence in that is really should be admissible and, and might make rulings that could skew the result, you need to be cautious and resolve every case you possibly can voluntarily but, but, before you get into a courtroom. You, you, will you start facilitative in a facilitative style? Brad? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and so you, you sort of ramp it up too. How about you, uh, Suzanne? Yeah, well, I never go to the ramp ups and I always stay facilitative. Okay. And um, what, can, can I just comment really quickly? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Did I, I'm sorry. Did I just cut, did I cut Suzanne off? I'm sorry. I'm a non-attorney, so I really wouldn't go down to like, you know, the only thing I might say is that it might reinforce that they are have more power than, and that do you really want somebody who really isn't as familiar, like even a judge to make that yep. decision? Yep. Use yeah, that too. Absolutely. But I do what Judge just said about the, the, the percentage. Mm -hmm. And I do put that in if we need to get to that. It's just like, mm -hmm. look, it, anything could happen. And I sort of give, again, the worst cases like br bracketing. Plaintiff could win 100% and get this much. Def you know, def plaintiff could lose, you get zero. And I try to get everybody to sort of gr agree on a percentage or likelihood of success. I mean, if we need to, and sometimes that helps to frame an offer in demand. If you think so, you have a 60, 40 yeah. chance of winning 75, 25, and sometimes that those help to frame it. And then if we have like a 60, 40 and a 75, 25, now all of a sudden, when you take those percentages, you know, compared to the number, all of a sudden the number starts to come out, like to starts to rise of what the right settlement number is. Okay. So what, Carl, what I'm hearing is, um, I just want to say quick is like, it seems like a lot of us are evaluative mediators, but to different degrees. And there's an interpretation as to what is evaluative. Is it what Michelle's saying, putting percentages on, or is it talking like John was saying, strengths and weaknesses? So there's a, a wide range of what we call evaluative. And Judge is going to say something. I think it's both those things, uh, Felicia. I think it's also talking about strength and weaknesses. Um, you also have to look, depending upon the case uh, you've got, how to approach it. If you're doing with an, uh, dealing with an LAD case or a fee shifting case, law against discrimination, it is, I think, very important, almost a mediator's responsibility to make sure people understand that if this gets litigated 
and the plaintiff wins a dollar, the plaintiff could win five hundred thousand dollars in counsel fees. Um, so I think that to some extent, at least, if you know what the results, possible results are, you should go over them to an extent. We're precluded from telling what the results are. I'm precluded from practicing law ethically. I cannot. So I can't advise people. And I tell them I can't advise you. You know, however, you know, talk to your lawyer because, you know, especially if you have lawyers there, you talk to them because they know 95 percent do. And you talk to them and they can then say, you know, I said, listen to your lawyer. If I, anything I'm saying sounds crazy to you or it sounds really skewed, pay no attention to it. Talk to your lawyer. Um, and I think people ought to be aware of the concept, possible consequences when they are trying to resolve something in a reasonable manner. Because, you know, a $100,000 claim when you could stand to lose a million is a lot more reasonable than a $100,000 claim when you could stand to lose 110000 You know, All it's true, but I, just to remind the audience, this is a pre-suit case, so we didn't yep. even get to LAD yeah. and to fee yeah. shifting yeah. and punitives and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a quick question while you're speaking, um, Brad, that Mark has about what could have been done to get you to be more cooperative um, during that joint session? Oh, I, th I think there was, if there was less accusation and it was, everything's a little bit milder. Um, if I wasn't, and, and, and I love Felicia, we've done this on, on more than <laughs> one occasion. <laughs> if I wasn't interrupted and I was allowed to continue, it would have been a much more mild, but when I was interrupted and it was, you know, my, you know, turn to speak, because believe me, I bit my tongue when Felicia was, was speaking. Um, I think it's, uh, I re I reacted and you know so I just, just just give me my ten minutes protecting my client yeah and I was protecting mine <laughs> so I, I, I also think by the way this case would have resolved one last I, question for the I, panel which is um, we talked a little bit about what you actually do do you tell your clients up front what you do that you start in you know that you're a facilitative mediator but I will do this I will do this blah, 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 or I won't do that. Do you describe that? In a sense, um, Dwight Golan has a description for his clients saying, this is what I'll do. I'll do all kinds of things. Do you tell your clients up front what you will do? Yes. Okay. Michelle. I tell them at the big, at the outset, like I said, I say, I'm not here to make a decision. And I will say to them that I will, um, you know, I'll help you facilitate a resolution. And I just leave it at that. And then if we end up using percentages or any like these little evaluation tools along the way, I'm helping them to facilitate, right? Um, and that, that's how I do it. Like I said, so, you know, I will try to get you all to come to a common, you know, to a mutually, a mutually agreeable re re resolution. Okay. I have a three page, I have a three page outline I go over with every client. Mm -hmm. Three pages. Wow. Yeah. It's not single space. <laughs> Request you. Request you. You describe your style to your clients beforehand. You mean the, the clients, you mean the parties in the mediation or what Who are you referring to? Yeah, the parties in the mediation. Yeah. Felicia no, no I, I agree Gosh. with what Michelle just said that I, 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 I don't get into the details of, of how I'm going to, whether I'm going to be evaluative or facilitative or whatever. I, I uh, and I, I agree with what, what Brad said earlier about um, uh, I, uh, as a, I would first warn uh, each side about what they're up against in, in the, uh, the possible uh, loss of the case, et cetera, uh, before I get into what my opinion is, my evaluation of the cases, I, I would, I certainly get, get into that first, how much it's gonna cost and what they're, what they're risking. Okay, Suzanne, I won't ask you the question because you say you stay facilitated. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. It was really good. Uh, you were all good performers, and I thought it was uh, really worthwhile. I'm sure we all learned a lot. Anyone, any last thought from anyone? Did yes. somebody ask a question about uh, if we got an independent doctor's analysis, would the parties be willing to agree to whatever that conclusion is um, uh, and make it a binding um, medical finding, if you will, that she could be accommodated in when and how? The answer is maybe. 
Um, yeah, that's a definite maybe because she has <laughs> such extensive medical history and records here. It's kind of, to me, an absurd you know, request in this type of situation. You know, she's not printing a certificate off of the internet saying I need a dog or, oh, I don't feel good. You know, this, this is long COVID, so. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Carl. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It was, that was fun. fun. Thanks, everybody. Okay. <laughs>